The Ukraine war has an impact that goes beyond the European continent. We're in Angola to talk to President João Lorenzo about the vision of an African country that is a major oil producer and a potential supplier of natural gas to Europe. Mr. President, first of all, thank you for giving us this interview. I have to address the war in Ukraine. In most of the resolutions adopted by the UN General Assembly, which were aimed at Russia, Angola abstained. Why? There were three resolutions. Of the three, Angola abstained on two. Abstention is not disapproval. Abstention means abstention. It should be interpreted as such. In the second resolution, Angola voted in favour because the resolution was very concrete. It aimed above all to condemn the annexation of the four regions from the Donbass, and Angola understood that the aggression in itself was already bad, it was already serious. But worse than the aggression was the annexation of a foreign territory, of a neighbouring country, a member of the United Nations. So at the time, Angola had a very clear option of voting in favour of the proposed resolution. In the most recent resolution, Angola abstained. However, beforehand, it took the precaution of trying to negotiate, if we may use that term, either the withdrawal or the easing, so to speak, of just one paragraph. I am referring specifically to the operative paragraph, as they call it, or P9, which referred to, let us say, taking the aggressor to an international criminal court. It is not that this cannot be done, but we understand, and we know negotiation methods, that when you are negotiating, you must always leave a door open. And we believe that the priority at the moment is to bring Russia to the negotiating table. We must do everything in our power to bring both parties, but especially Russia, to the negotiating table to achieve a lasting ceasefire and to negotiate peace not only with Ukraine, but also with NATO. What do you think is the impact of this war in Africa? Africa is not an isolated island in the world. So we live in a globalized world with a huge interdependence between nations. The economic crisis, the energy crisis, the security crisis, this war in Ukraine has affected all countries in the world, without exception, and perhaps more so the African continent, because we have more vulnerabilities. You are committed to contributing to the pacification of the African continent in the case of the Central African Republic. You advocated lifting the arms embargo on the government so that it could defend itself. Is this the only solution for peace? It is certainly not the only one. It's necessary that the country fulfills the Luanda roadmap. In some ways it has already begun to do so, but the process is not complete. It's therefore necessary to negotiate with all the living forces in the country, with the opposition in particular, at least that opposition that is in the Central African Territory, and give opportunities to other political actors to participate in the political life of the country. Regarding the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is a severe humanitarian crisis resulting from this war. What initiatives did you propose at the African Union summit of heads of state and government to solve this crisis? You mean the one in Addis Ababa? Yes, exactly. 
Well, the proposals were not only from Angola. They are from various heads of state. What must be stressed is that the conclusion was that two steps must be taken. One step in particular, which is to seek at all costs a definitive ceasefire, because it has been violated time and time again. The one that came out of the Luanda summit was violated time and time again. A new ceasefire must be reached. It is necessary immediately after this ceasefire to take the next step of quartering the M23 forces. For this process to take place, the summit concluded that there is a need for the deployment of the regional force, which is composed of several countries, namely Kenya, Burundi, South Sudan, Uganda and Tanzania. So only one of those countries already has troops on the ground. I'm talking about Kenya, which is bearing the cost of maintaining its forces on the ground. But the other four countries are having some financial difficulty in covering this deployment operation. And the African Union summit, especially its Peace and Security Committee, will draw on the continent's Peace and Security Fund to cover this expense. How do you negotiate with these armed groups? The Addis Abeba summit asked Angola to establish direct contact with the M23 leadership in order to convince them to accept the ceasefire and the quartering of their forces and we immediately set about fulfilling that mission that was given to us. And at this very moment, Angola is already maintaining contacts with the leadership of the M23. The current geopolitical context forced us to review our priorities. Europe at this moment is looking for an option to replace Russian gas. Is Angola an alternative? Angola is an alternative. Angola, at the moment, produces more oil than gas, although we do have some gas. But we have set up a new consortium for gas production, so several multinationals are going to start exploring more gas in Angola, so there are identified reserves. Gas in Angola was not developed much because there was a lack of legislation. Angola did not have specific legislation for gas focused on gas, and this somewhat inhibited multinationals. But this situation is over since 2017, and we believe that the production of natural gas, non-associated gas in Angola, will experience a boom in the coming years. And therefore, from then on, Europe can count on Angola as an important supplier not only of gas, but also of green hydrogen. We are already making contacts with some European countries for the production of green hydrogen. Angola still depends almost exclusively on oil, but one of the goals of your government is the diversification of the economy. How is it getting on? We are doing well. So the non-oil sector of our economy is experiencing, let's say, satisfactory growth. And we are going to continue along this path. But it will take some time before oil revenues move into the background. So today, they are still the most significant, but the trend is reversing. There will come a turning point when the national GDP will be made up mainly of revenues coming from the non-oil sector.
You propose to develop tourism, agriculture and fisheries. In relation to tourism, for example, there is the so-called historic diaspora. It is estimated that 12 million U.S. citizens have Angolan ancestry. How can this connection be strengthened? We have begun to make contacts with some representatives of the African diaspora in the United States. They have already made some visits to Angola. I mean to Angola, not just to Luanda. They are not limited to Luanda. They are very enthusiastic. I'm not just talking about returning, but about establishing this connection, which has been somewhat interrupted over the centuries. So from our side, there is this interest, and we will give all the necessary support so that today, the Afro-descendants maintain this connection with us, with the continent, and in particular with Angola. Is it easier today for an entrepreneur and investor to set up in Angola? Yes, of course, it's much easier. And it's not just me who say so. It's the investors themselves. For the more than five years that I've been at the head of the country's affairs, one of our concerns has been to create a business environment that's different from the one we inherited. Therefore, a better business environment. One of the features of this better business environment is, without a shadow of a doubt, the fight against corruption. I cannot guarantee that there is no longer any corruption in Angola. In fact, there is corruption everywhere in the world. But what I can guarantee is that corruption in Angola today is no longer done with impunity. In other words, whenever the authorities become aware of this practice, no matter by whom it is carried out, the case will not go unpunished. At the last African Unit Summit, you were with the Portuguese Prime Minister, Antonio Costa. He said that one of the topics discussed was how to boost relations between Europe and Africa. What can Angola do at this level? What can Angola do at this level? Tell the Europeans that what we want are real relations of cooperation, which sometimes does not happen. And we want to combat a certain paternalism that sometimes exists. And to say that we also have something to offer Europe. It is not only Europe that has capital, that has the know-how to offer our continent. We also have something very important to give in return. So the benefit of cooperation between our two continents is reciprocal. What can the European Union and the member states do to promote these relations? What the European Union can do, and in some ways is doing, is to discuss with us as equals the interest in North-South cooperation. So to change some of the rules of the game, it is very clear that today our continent is decolonized in de facto terms, but even so, even decades after colonization, international relations are still not fair. There are international rules that mean everything in trade, in the trade of raw materials, that we need to sit down and renegotiate. It's not for nothing that we want, Africa wants, a seat on the G20. It wants a seat one or more, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, precisely to correct these relations, which to date we still consider to be unfair in some way. 
The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has said that Angola is a strategic partner. For you, in which areas? In fundamental areas of the life of countries, namely in the field of security, I mean international security, Angola has something to say. And in the economic field, in the production of foodstuffs to feed the world, we have enough land and enough water. We lack the capital and the know-how to be a country that can supply food to not Angola, but the world. The United States is going to invest $2 billion in a photovoltaic system. One of Angola's objectives is to develop renewable energy. Are you on the right track? We are not very far from reaching the goal we set ourselves. At present, 64% of the energy produced in Angola is no longer from polluting sources. 64% is hydroelectric energy, essentially hydroelectric energy. But it is also starting to be photovoltaic energy. Last year we inaugurated two large photovoltaic plants in Bengala province. We have a project planned for the east of the country and we have this major project with an American company that will produce and supply energy to four provinces in southern Angola. Our goal by 2026 is to make the leap from 64 to around 70% of energy from clean sources. Besides all these economic transformations that are already underway, you have promised the creation of municipalities. When will the elections take place? That is not a question of a promise. It was an electoral promise? It is a decision. No, it's not electoral. We presented this issue of municipalities right after the beginning of my first mandate. So I came to the presidency of the Republic of Angola in 2017, and if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2018 or 2019, I'm not too sure, that a meeting of the Council of the Republic and on our initiative, my initiative, we talked about the possibility of organizing local elections. And this is all a process. It's a, it's a process. There have never been local elections in Angola. This will be the first time. When will they take place? I don't know. But they will have to happen, necessarily. For there to be local elections, there must be legal support. We are in the democratic state of law. Everything has to have a legal basis. The specialists have defined a set of more than 10 municipal laws of municipal power, and most of them have already been approved by the National Assembly, with the exception, I believe, of one fundamental one. More than one is missing, but one is fundamental which is the definition of the timing for holding these elections. In other words, there are two different positions. There are those who think that, for the very first time, the country should hold local elections in all of the country's municipalities. This is one position. And there are those who are more prudent. I would not say more conservative, but more prudent and consider that, because it's a new experience, it would be, let us say, a shot in the dark to start by holding it in all the municipalities of the country. They think that this could be done in phases. When this dispute between political forces is overcome, the law will be approved, and from then on, 
the head of state will be in a position to create the conditions to call local elections. Mr. President, Mr. President, it was a pleasure talking to you. See you next time. Thank you very much.